Howdy, yo. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let's go down a rabbit hole together just for a moment. And I'll keep you on my train of thought here. But to start, I was casually browsing some pre-1900 photographs of ancient ruins, as I'm one to do. And I found some very solid photographs, to say the least. Now, what struck me the most in these images and in this research was the temple of the Olympian Zeus in Athens, Greece. Breathtaking, fascinating, complicated, with a history just as convoluted. We are told in the narrative that the temple of Olympian Zeus is dedicated to Zeus as head of the Olympian gods. Now take this all with a grain of salt, but we're told construction began in the 6th century BC by pagan tyrants of Greece, on top of the ruins of an ancient temple which was also dedicated to Zeus. Hippias and Hipparchos are said to be the tyrants in charge at that time, who hired a group of four architects to design a temple which would be unmatched in all of antiquity. The temple of Olympian Zeus, apparently, was intended at first to be built in the ancient Doric style from local limestone on a platform roughly 41 meters or nearly 135 feet by 108 meters or nearly 355 feet. Remarkably, this was all to be flanked by a double colonnade. It certainly sounds beautiful. However, we're told in this narrative that by 510 BC, Hippias and the tyrannical rule of Greece was overthrown, making way for a much more intelligent, reasonable, and realistic Greece. This revolution caused the temple of Olympian Zeus to halt its construction entirely. Greek mindsets changed, and the free Greek thinkers marked the temple with hubris. It sat unfinished, just an absolutely massive platform, for nearly 336 years. During this time period, Aristotle pioneered the concept of the white elephant, claiming the temple of Olympian Zeus was an example of a project hoisted above the population's needs so extravagant, with nothing to compare it to or against, used as a means to convince the population to give up their time, their money, and their rights to help conceive it. In the end, the project, in this case the temple, became too large to manage and was always better in theory than it was in real life. At this point, according to this same narrative, we are led to believe that over three centuries then passed as the massive temple foundation stood untouched. Then. In 174 BC, construction was miraculously begun again under new, strict Roman design. This time, the material was changed to be expensive marble, while the order was changed from Doric to Corinthian, the first time Corinthian was used on a public temple. This design for the Temple of Olympian Zeus would include 104 columns, each 17 meters or nearly 56 feet tall and 2 meters or over 6.5 feet in diameter. However, with the death of the Greek Hellenistic king Antiochus IV, construction again stopped. The temple of Olympian Zeus, nearly complete, then remained untouched again for nearly a century until Athens was sacked in 86 BC. The original, completed columns of the Temple of Olympian Zeus were then stolen and used to build the Temple of Jupiter. When Augustus became the first Roman Emperor, he would make a lackluster attempt to finally rebuild the Temple of Olympian Zeus. However, this was not seriously or successfully undertaken until Roman Emperor Hadrian in the 2nd century AD approximately 638 years after initial construction had begun. Athens was then severely sacked in 267 AD when it is believed that the Temple of Olympian Zeus was almost completely destroyed. The temple was never rebuilt or repaired. The temple's remains were then systematically quarried for building materials for the next dozen centuries, and only 21 of the original 104 columns remained as of the year 1436. Today, in 2022, only 15 columns remain, with a 16th on the ground nearby 
from when it fell in a great storm in the year 1852. However, besides these outstanding photographs, I must ask, do you see anything particularly strange in these images? Would you believe me if I told you that, even in the mid-1800s when these photographs were taken, we had a form of photo manipulation or old world photoshopping that was going on. This was what really intrigued me as I began this research into the temple. We're looking at the oldest known images of this temple of Olympian Zeus. However, in some of these images, we see the remains of an additional structure on top, a structure that would to me seem to imply that a much larger design than artist renditions of the original structure we see today. However, in modern photographs, in 2022 photography, and if you visit this site, we see that the image and the temple remains are much different than we see in the earliest artistic depictions and the very earliest photographs. There appears to be an additional structure and the remains of an additional structure, the ruins of an additional structure on top. What is this structure and where did it go? Instantly, I was intrigued. I thought possibly the photography showing the protuberance were in fact the edited photographs, but it turns out it's actually vice versa. The extra stone structure on top here, that was really there. We can look at older artistic depictions, paintings from before photography, and we can see that this additional top of the structure, top of the column is included. So does this mean that the temple of Olympian Zeus was actually much, much larger than we are led to believe today? Well, the answer is yes and no. See, according to the current narrative, this additional stonework on top of the columns, which to me seems to match identically the stonework of the columns, is actually a much, much later construction. But what is it? Prepare yourselves. We're told that this was actually the home of a stylite. Now, what is a stylite? A stylite, also known as a pillar saint, is a Christian who, according to the narrative, would climb to the top of a pillar or a column of a fallen building, usually one of extreme significance, and then set up shop, so to speak, and live there atop the pillar for as long as possible. Now, I'm not sure just how many fallen temples we had throughout these ancient times, but we're told the practice of stylites occurred from 423, beginning with St. Simeon stylites throughout the mid 1400s, and in some very distinct areas, still continues to this day. We are told these stylites believe the mortification of their bodies would guarantee their salvation in the face of God. I find this to be absolutely fascinating. We're told for nearly 1,000 years of history, this was a common practice amongst Christians. Furthermore, and this is where it gets really interesting, we're told that the old pagan temples, those deconstructed and abandoned, were then taken up by these stylites who would essentially position themselves on the non-fallen pillars like living statues and preach the Christian faith from atop their new columns. Now, doesn't this remind you of modern day victory statues, for example? The things we see today, statues on top of pillars? Was this something that originated with these pillar saints? I'm not exactly sure the time period for this invention except what we're told in the narrative. But with all of history, we can see overlaps and we know we can't be 100% sure of exact timelines. But I find it fascinating to know about this history specifically that we have these human-like statues that we see appearing in ancient history on top of single pillars and single columns, standalones, not attached to a larger structure or building. Now, this is a style that we see echoed often in the 1700s and the 1800s, especially in places like America, places that were heavily Christian. Heck, my hometown has a large statue on a huge pillar in the very center of my city. But the real question here is, 
How old is this practice of designing a lifelike statue and putting it on top of a pillar or a column? We've often heard in the comments of my videos alone and others about the absolutely brilliant sculptures that we see in the ancient world, specifically sculptures from Greece and Rome that are almost too detailed to be imaginable. Some have mentioned that these sculptures almost appear to be petrified humans frozen in time. Now, I find it interesting that throughout all of my research, literally years of it, I've never been introduced to stylites or the idea that the first Christians in Greece and Rome, at least a good number of them, would take up residence on top of pillars and columns of fallen pagan temples. Now, is this really a metaphor for those temples being converted to Christianity? Or do we really believe that hundreds of human beings went and lived on top of pillars and columns of fallen buildings and lived amongst the debris of these fallen structures? We have Simeon Stylites the Elder, who, as the first stylite, converted to Christianity around the age of 13. At age 16, he was deemed by the church to be too extreme in his beliefs to be allowed in public, so he became a recluse. Still, Simeon was bothered by others so he left society to live in the wilderness. When he went without food or drink for the entire length of Lent, only to return alive, the same society who shunned him then considered him to be blessed and considered him to be a saint. Yet, Simeon disliked the attention. Simeon then discovered the fallen temple of Telenissa. Here, he found a pillar which called to him. He decided it was God's calling for him to live atop this pillar for the rest of his days. And so he did. And from there, we have hundreds of other stylites documented throughout history, including Daniel the stylite, who lived on top of his pillar for 33 years and is celebrated in December. In the end, it appears stylites are just the tip of an iceberg which I have yet to fully comprehend. When we tie this back to the temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens, we are told the extra structure, stone and masonry, that we see in the earliest photographs of the temple is in fact a stylite home. We are told a Christian stylite at some point using the exact same stone and masonry that the temple of Olympian Zeus was built with added a massive stylite quote home on top of the ancient pillars of the temple. According to the same current narrative, this is not part of the original structure. Convenient, but it gets even stranger. That is, if we're looking at this from an unbiased opinion because the narrative also goes on to explain that by the early 1900s, nearly all of the stylite homes or evidence that the stylites ever existed were torn down by the governments of Europe and the Middle East and these other locations. So to wrap it up, we have Amazing structures that I began looking at today, looking at the oldest known photographs of these places. One of those structures just so happened to be the temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens. Discrepancies between photographs of the temple led me to find out that this temple was once much larger, at least in one section, and this is due to a stylite home being on that section. A stylite is a Christian who decides to live atop a ruined pillar or column of the ancient world to promote Christianity and to achieve salvation. There were thousands of stylites in the ancient world, meaning there were thousands of fallen temples and fallen superstructures. Stylites and their stylite homes atop these pillars, however, became unpopular in most areas by the 1900s and nearly all the pillars and columns with stylite evidence were torn down or changed. At the same time, the stylites themselves lived on top and inside the pillars. Pillars in ancient Greek and Rome literally were used to hold up the buildings. They did not contain statues or anything else on top originally. However, one common occurrence of Christian architecture is the standalone pillar topped with a statue. Did this idea arise from the stylites of nearly 2,000 years ago? Could the stylites the idea that there is innumerable pillars and columns being taken over, could this essentially help prove what we already believe, that the old world actually contained far more in number 
and far more advanced buildings than we give it credit for. Have you ever heard of Stylites before? What do you think about the temple of Olympian Zeus? Could the Stylite story possibly be one used to cover up the true nature of these buildings? Like the temple of Olympian Zeus, which could have actually been much larger than what the current narrative gives it credit for, do you see any sort of evidence standing out for that argument? Are the Stylites a placeholder for unexplainable history or did Stylites really exist in the way they are described in the narrative? I'd be absolutely thrilled to hear your thoughts about this down below in the comments. And as always, a big thank you to my supporters and donators on the channel. Logan Roth, thank you, brother. You guys, if you feel so obliged, can support me right here. This channel is still growing, and with everything happening in the world right now, I think uncovering the discrepancies of our past is key to helping us unite for the future. That being said, I honestly still don't know what to make of these stylites. It sounds like a fabrication, and yet we see evidence, at least photographic evidence, that shows that the Temple of Olympian Zeus had additional structures on top that were labeled stylite homes. Are they really stylite residences, or is this just a great way to explain the things which we cannot? I honestly couldn't tell you with certainty, but these photographs were so amazing, and this information so interesting and useful and convoluted that I felt like I had to share it with you. So again, I really appreciate you guys being here. I'm looking forward to catching up with you in the comment section down below, and I look forward to speaking with you on the next video. Cheers.